first one to send it back. <laughs> it's fine, okay. but... So this is a Q&A, January 17th, 2023, Baking with Borderlands community. So if you're new here, welcome. Um, lots of familiar, there's a couple of familiar people here. And then we also have questions that are sent in from people who can't attend. Or basically you can just throw this up on YouTube after the recording is done. But this hour is yours. It's for you guys to answer whatever questions you guys might have about decorating, yes, baking, yes. But if you also have questions about like- Unsolicited side, life advice. Life advice, <laughs> mental health, um, whatever you want to talk about, this is your time. So use it. And we're gonna do these once a month. Yes, is, is what we're trying to get to. So I'm going to open it up to the floor and we're just going to, whoever wants to ask a question, go ahead and unmute, uh, show your video if you'd like, and we'll start taking questions. Who's first? Do we have to call on someone? Ooh. Well, maybe I'll read one just in case anyone's feeling a little shy Let's or figuring that. out the tech side of things. I know we've got a couple of people still joining. Um, so I'm going to start with an email from Sarah. Sarah was wondering, how long do you suggest leaving naked cookies in an airtight container? I'm assuming she means without no icing. icing okay. Right. Yep. So question was, how long do you suggest leaving naked cookies in a container? And I'm also going to preface this by saying it depends on the recipe and the bake and how you like them. So a lot of people here, uh, the, the the average is like people like softer, chewier cookies, not brown for the most part. Some people do, most people don't. So assuming that your cookies are baked fully, not like over or under, usually in an airtight container, they're probably good about two to three days and then they begin to dry out because even in an airtight container, everything is porous and you're going to lose a little bit. If you know you're going to be decorating like a week later, go ahead and just put them in a Ziploc and throw it in the freezer. That's going to help retain that moisture a lot better than just on the counter airtight container. So two to three days to be very conservative. I know people who leave their cookies in the containers for a lot longer than that, but that's a safe bet. I'm going to write this down or we're going to do this later and then transcribe it. Oh, I was just going to drop the, the video it. for okay. everyone. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's the quick answer for, um, who was it, Sarah? For Sarah. Sarah. And then okay. she has a follow-up question. Follow-up question. Uh, I was also wondering if you have ever had candles or Glade plugins around your house affect the taste of your cookies. And it's oh, kind of a weird question, but I have noticed sometimes they have a weird taste and sometimes they don't. I wonder what this weird taste is. Okay, this is super interesting. Um, this reminds me of an instance where I had a friend who had a cookie freezer and she cut up onions, a lot of onions because they were on sale, put them in gallon Ziplocs, double Ziplocked and put them in the freezer along with naked cookies. Mm -hmm. That entire batch of cookies that went in the freezer along with the onions took up the scent uh, of the onions mm -hmm. and it was, it was no good anymore. So I can see how that can happen similarly with like a candle or something that has a lot of smell, but I just don't have that personal experience to verify. Does anyone else have any experience with? It would make sense. Yeah. I think the, the pivot for that is to make like a garlic royal icing <laughs> and still be able to conserve and save them stuff. Yeah. Be like, this that is would a be suggestion. Cookie. Yes, convert it to full savory. Yeah, so I can see that, but also, I'm not 100% sure because I haven't had that experience. Who likes to light candles and decorate cookies at the same time? I totally understand that. But it's Jessica, fun. Jessica's like laughing and you shook your head. I, I want to hear. I, I haven't actually experienced it myself, but I'm very cautious because I am very afraid that the uh, scent will absorb into the cookie. So mm. especially around the holidays when you get more of the cinnamony um mm. fragrance uh like pine pine cones and stuff like i'm just mm. very i'm very cautious about that because i don't want it to happen <laughs> yeah okay cool so i think that's a safe answer for her i think so too yeah. 
Anybody else have any questions they want to jump in, jump in with before I uh, go ahead and read the next one? I have a question. So if you make your dough and you freeze it, and then you unfreeze it, you bake your cookies, you frost them, can I then freeze them again? Yes. Okay. So yes, yes, but I think is the, is the, the full answer. So it all depends on like sort of the moisture content that's going on in your cookie and your environment. A lot of the times, if you've already sort of heat sealed an iced cookie that's mm -hmm. already been like totally dried, you put it in the freezer, you take it out again. If it starts to like build condensation in that process, it's gonna be hard to put additional work onto that cookie because that moisture has already started to affect the icing layer that was there before, right? Is that the question? You've already iced it. He's I've already it. iced it. I've already finished it. Yeah. I've sealed it. Mm -hmm. and then I put it them in an airtight container. Mm -hmm. And now it's like two days before my son's wedding because mm -hmm. I have to make a couple hundred cookies. So, mm -hmm. so like food, you shouldn't freeze food, defrost it, and yeah. then freeze it again. Is it the same with cookies? Is, it, I guess what I'm asking. Kind it's pretty of. safe, but like it's always a little iffy because once you take the cookie out, depending on if you've left it in the sun or it gets too warm, it has a chance to build some bacteria because our cookies are a little softer, right? There's still moisture okay. in that cookie. So it's always a risk very very low from like a food safety perspective but okay. I think more importantly because you're kind of heat sealed a fully done cookie as it's sitting in that heat seal throughout the freezing process the texture kind of becomes homogenous throughout the cookie so the moisture evens out across the cookie and permeates a little bit into the icing that because of that if you add more work to that it's gonna struggle a little bit with bleeding potentially is my guess so I recommend just freezing it once and done and not having to take it out from the freezer to do additional work on cookies that are already like totally iced okay. and sealed okay thank yeah, you it's just a being safe kind of thing um there's a question from Carolyn I have the hardest time uh with pricing especially for family and friends do you have a standard you go by if uh if i may say something firm if they are your family and friends and they want to support you the idea is that they should want to just pay you them something but if you really want to go out of your way and give them like a friends and family discount usually kind of like the 10 to 20 percent if you're very generous is a good kind of place yep. so take your retail pricing that you would give to strangers and then knock off 10 to 20 percent and it should be good 20 percent is my, very generous is my number i use because i'm a service-based yeah. business so i have a little bit more margins yeah. but that's what i tell everyone is my friends and family rate that's basically 20 percent off what your off the shelf rate would be does that help? Does anyone else feel like they have any insights or additional input in uh, regarding that? I think I've been giving too much of a discount to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I usually do it for free, so I I get it. I 100% empathize. Yeah, I've been I've been doing the stuff. I've been doing like for free, or I've given them for like half the price, not 20%. Yeah. So it's too generous. Yeah. Yeah, and honestly, and Jessica just said my grandma insists on paying full price at all the time. I think that's oh, beautiful. That's a grandma. Yeah, that's ideal. I'll, I'll say, I'll chime in. Um, when I first started out, I wanted the experience. And so a lot of times yeah. I would offer, say, let me make the cake. I think when it comes from you as a gift, it's a little bit easier, but you don't yeah. want to get into the habit of giving your friends and family discounts all the time, because if you really are looking to build this as a business, like Lisa said, they should be paying you full price. And I'll say 
now at the point where I am, I don't have any friends or family that ask for discounts. I love that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the follow up was how about how much for a four inch several layered cookie? Um, this is pricing is really subjective because it depends on your location. So your geography and what that market in that area will hold your experience and the level of work that you're able to sort of do. And then also related to that is like your level of like, I guess, popularity to put it bluntly yeah. and how in demand that product or your product is. So to give you a concrete example, I've actually got a blog post on pricing that we will, can you take a note that we'll send it out to people where I kind of break down from the final price of the product down to my hourly rate. And then you can kind of see how much you make in an hour. And then you can sort of work the numbers back and forth to see if that's the adequate price for you. I'm in Sacramento, California. Um, it's a pretty wealthy area, all things considered. Our median, like how income is like 90 grand or something for a household, 80, 90. Oh, it's yeah, it's quite high. And um, I think for me now, for where I'm at, I charge starting at $85 a dozen. And that's for about a four inch length cookie that is basic. So if you're doing work, that's a lot of detail. Um, if you're saying several layered cookies, so if I'm flooding, I'm airbrushing, and then I'm adding details and I'm painting those details, we're looking at 125 to 150 a dozen for, for my area. Yeah. She said, thank you, that helps a lot. Yeah. Who is next? Oh, we have a person to add. The hand I have a question about the the I don't know if you're if you're moving on from the uh, from the packaging issue because I have a question about that. Let's go. Um, so I had I, I was always you were talking about freezing. So mm -hmm. for a whole year, I would freeze my cookies and I would I would thaw them right before my party. So I never had cookies laying around. Right. And mm -hmm. then I started getting the uh, plastic packaging with the heat sealed. Mm -hmm. And so for Christmas, I made like 200 cookies mm -hmm. and I store them in a box. Mm -hmm. And I started noticing that some of my color was bleeding. Not every single one of them though. And I'm not sure why it happened, but I, it, I've never had cookies bleed because I always, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always thaw them right before I used them or gave them away or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this time I had cookies laying around for a month and a half. And then the the color started bleeding. So I'm just wondering, is there what what causes bleeding? I'm gonna ask a follow-up question. Is it color bleed or is it butter bleed? Color bleed. So the colors are leaching into each other and it looks like yeah, something like got the, like socked in the eye. Yeah, like the red was sort of melting into the white. Kind of so, like yeah. Yeah. So bleeding is a really interesting and a little bit complex. So bleeding happens for several reasons. Can you also make sure no one else joined? Um, bleeding happens for a variety of reasons. It happens when our consistency is a little thin. It happens when the consistency between the layers are different so that the thinner layer is has more moisture in it and the thicker layer has less moisture in it and they start pulling moisture from each icing layer causing that color to bleed between layers, whether it's side to side or up and down. So what I tell people to do, first thing that you can do to prevent bleeding is to ensure that your icing consistency for the base icing is correct. That means not under and not over. If it's under, your icing looks a little bit translucent. If it's over, it's very voluminous, very porous. And you can tell because when it dries, it looks more like meringue when it breaks. So if you know that that's not your problem, next is when you mix your icing colors. When you mix your icing colors, a lot of people like to mix colors and let them sit for a while. Um, when icing sits on like the table, it starts to separate almost immediately depending on your consistency. The moment it begins to separate, you start to lose that structural integrity 
And then there are some parts of the icing that will not be as structurally stable as other parts. So I say, if you're gonna be waiting more than an hour to pipe, massage your icing bags, make sure that you get it all nice and combined again, and that should help reduce bleeding. The other thing is when you're layering two different colors together, and I learned this kind of recently in the last two years, is I used to wait until my base layer or my first layer was totally dry before adding the next, but what was happening was the dry and the wet were starting to pull moisture from each other, causing that icing bleed. So what I would do now is if I'm doing wet on wet, they go next, like right next to each other, but same concept for on top. So I let my base layer just crust. And then I add my next layer so that the moisture is not like, the, the difference is not too big. Miranda, mm -hmm. is any of this like doing anything? Yes, yes okay. that actually helps a lot. And that's what I've been doing lately where I don't let the crust dry completely. But but I I don't know what it was with this one, but yeah, I will I will just keep in mind. Uh, yeah. yeah, I really think um, a lot of people underestimate what happens to your icing when it sits around. After mm -hmm. for me, even half an hour for a flood icing, I see it begin to separate a little bit, and I'm very cautious now of making sure that I always massage my bags a little bit. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Good. Cool. Uh, I will grab one from the email. This one is, <clears throat> hi, Lisa, love your cookie art and videos. I have a question. I'm still just starting out and I'm looking for tips on how to organize, organize myself so that I don't end up losing time and trashing my kitchen every time I start <laughs> decorating. How do you organize your icing specifically? Do you make two bags of each color before Ooh. you start? One outline and one flood bag? Do you just make buckets of icing every time and then just store the leftovers? I just seem to end up going through tons of piping bag, tons of piping bags with lots going in the garbage at the end of the day. It's a bit frustrating. Any tips you think are helpful would be fantastic. From Jennifer in Toronto. Okay, this is a, uh, there's a lot here. I have to read just to make sure. How to organize yourself, mm -hmm. losing time, trash my kitchen. All right, so I think Jennifer would benefit from our our course that goes end to end, right? Because especially when you're starting new, it's so overwhelming. But I immediately gleaned that she uses two consistencies. So she uses a, uh, an outline and a flood. Um, it's cool if she wants to continue doing that, but really minimizing if she's able to, if we can get her on a single consistency, that will cut everything in half when it comes to flood, right? She only has to do one bag for it. Um, it really depends on how many cookies she's working with and if she's doing orders, if this is a business um, or if she's just doing it, you know, one night a week, is she working on this two hours a day, five hours a day mm -hmm. across how many days, depending on what her situation is, I'd give different kinds of advice, but my go-to is I know I'm decorating cookies all the time. So I want to have dough ready to go anytime I feel like having dough ready to go. That means if I have a free 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to go and make a batch of dough. I've got everything coming to room temp right now because after this tonight, I'm going to make a dough. So having that dough prepped, ready in your freezer and your fridge is going to be really easy for you. And same thing with icing. I do have a buck. I do have buckets of icing and I pre-make it whenever I can throw it in the freezer. You have it when you're ready. Um, what else does she say? Um, Organize my icing. Specific. I do the one bowl method. So it's very little cleanup as far as how much icing bowls you have to clean up. So we'll drop that in for her too. And then going through tons of piping bags with lots going in the garbage at the end of the day. It sounds like the other thing she might be able to benefit from is like getting better with the calculations for how much icing she's using for each cookie, for each color. Um, I've got a blog post and a YouTube video that I collaborated with Dave, Baked by Dave, where he has a royal icing calculator depending on the size of your cookie. So you can kind of go in and just say, I'm doing a dozen cookies, four inches, two flood colors, uh, how much icing am I gonna need? 
and he will give it to you by weight and it's very accurate and gives you a little bit of extra just in case. So we will also link her to we that. We'll definitely drop that as well. Mm -hmm. Could you go back to where you said you make your icing and put it in the freezer? So are mm -hmm. you making just the plain icing, yeah. your yeah. recipe, yeah. and you put it in an airtight and you put it in the freezer? Mm -hmm. And then you I make, yep. So okay. I make uh, my base icing. I do four pounds. I use four pounds of powdered sugar at a time for my base icing. So it's like a double batch. And I would make that, I put it in an airtight container and shove it in the freezer so that I would always have it. And if I'm going to be decorating cookies, I pull it out a couple hours before so that it can come down to room temp. And then I'll take it out and color it right before I decorate. Okay. And you can even freeze like colored icing. So sometimes if I know I'm going to be busy or I know I'm going to be disrupted, I'll mix all my icing, bag it up, throw it in the freezer immediately, and that prevents uh, prevents it from separating as quickly as well. So freezing is a really good tool for people. So you bag it up into your piping bags and throw mm -hmm. it in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And then okay. it kind of just like stops time for a moment. <laughs> and when you're ready, um, icing won't freeze solid. So you can kind of take it out, give it about an hour and then give it a good massage. So you get it all recombined and then you can pipe. Okay. I take my piping bags and then I fold the end over and I use mm. packaging tape and mm. I tape the end and then I tape the other, I have a twist tape and, and then I freeze it that way. It, well, I got right a in, for you. Right I'm in the bag. I'm back. I'm right back. I'm gonna have <laughs> I'm going to sit here and entertain everyone. <laughs> Anyone it's know any a good way jokes? to try to avoid wasting bags and your time and your color? Absolutely. And just general waste, too. You don't want to just throw those things away, right? All right. Uh, is it okay to submit a question here? It oh, absolutely please. is okay yeah. to submit Thank a question you. here. Give me all the questions. We got like 35 minutes. Okay. Ice uh, piping bag. This is my leftover icing from last night. It's starting to separate. I didn't put it in the freezer yet. But instead of like taping and everything, because I am literally the laziest decorator you will ever meet. Really? I, most efficient <laughs> decorator you'll ever meet. Yeah. So I like to like pinch a little bit of icing out of the top, give it a twist, just shove it in. Mm -hmm. No tape, nothing throw it all in the bag, we're done. See, I just was afraid that somehow ice crystals would get in there. I put it in a Ziploc bag too it, then. Yeah, it won't, it won't. It Once doesn't. you like Ziploc baggy it, you're good. <laughs> Less work for you. Cause, Cause I do do that method where I put it inside, but yeah. I just, when I freeze it, I'm just afraid that ice crystals are gonna get in there and then it's You'll gonna be, be yucky. You'll be good, yeah. Okay. All right. And we have a follow-up. I'm so sorry to go back to this. There is another gal that is much better and has been doing this a lot longer in my area. We are a small community. And I got an email from a mutual friend asking me to stop charging so little as I guess I'm taking some of her clients. I'm only charging less because I'm not as experienced as her. Is there a cookier rule <laughs> regarding this? I don't want to make people upset. Okay, so I would offer that this is not just a cookier rule, but this is a community rule for any industry, any small business especially, is like a rising tide raises all the boats, right? right. So the moment you severely undercharge, that affects everybody. Hmm. Hard stop. It doesn't matter what our intentions are at that point. It just is because it sets the expectation in our customers' eyes that, hey, this is how much this stuff is worth. So it's not that you're wrong. It's that this is how it's interpreted by the clients. So there's definitely like, I understand like the, there's no intent of um, wanting to undercharge or undercut, but the result and the effect that it has on our industry and our clients is that they think, oh, cookies are only $35 a dozen. Um, and it just kind of sets that expectation. So if you can charge more and you can help raise everybody, that's incredible. But if you really hold tight to, and you feel like you can't charge that much, 
that's okay. But the result of that is you have to deal with us. <laughs> and then emails from like your friend and stuff like that. But no matter what, right? You got to do the thing that you feel good about. So if you feel good about it, stick with it. That's what I would tell you. Yeah, people are telling you to raise your prices. Raise your prices. Man, raise those <laughs> prices. <laughs> yeah, champagne problems indeed. Uh, so you want to read that? Is that the last That is the most recent you've got. Yeah. And also, like, secret, we're going to be upsetting somebody no matter what we do. I think that's, like, yeah, the truth. I piss people off every single day. If someone's going to message you and say, how do you charge that much for a cookie? And how dare you yeah, do that? No so, matter well, what. It's going to be bad either way. All right. I had to join Lady Natural, but any tips for avoiding these hated creators when you fill small shapes? Heck yeah. Hold on, I'm oh, just no. pulling up my no. uh, my notes. No. <laughs> so avoiding craters. Um, this is going to go back to the basics where we talk about your base icing because your base icing can literally make or break. And I think Alva, Alva, she's still on here. When she first started, she was struggling with consistency. And the moment she got her base icing dialed in, like a lot of those consistency challenges went away too. She was under beating her icing in some cases, causing a little bit of translucency. That means your meringue powder has not fully activated and your structure is compromised. So don't underbeat and don't overbeat your base icing. That's key. Once you got that, move on to the other things. The other things are if you're doing small areas that tend to um, kind of dip or crater, you want to make sure that your icing is as thick as you can possibly have it and still be able to work with it as thick as possible. <laughs> That's key. But the second part of that is getting it under some kind of airflow. So whether that be a fan or a dehydrator to help it crust as fast as possible so that it doesn't have a chance to settle and dip in. Um, using icing that's been freshly mixed. So we uh, go back and talk about how, you know, if you let your icing sit, it's gonna start separating even past an hour. Make sure if it's been sitting around, you give it a good massage so that it's structurally sound. Um, and then finally, I think some of you may be familiar. Uh, my friend Corianne has this technique where if she's like filling a tiny area, she outlines it and puts some squiggles, waits for the squiggles to crust over and then puts the icing on top of that to create some puff. That works great too. You still got to get it under a, some fan, a fan or a moving air, air source to really help it sort of crust over and keep that shape. Hopefully that helps. Dehydrate or work better for that rather than in front yeah. of a fan? I feel like they both work really well. And it just mm -hmm. depends on kind of your situation and your setup. Some people use those clip-ons that go on the side of the table and that works well or like a rotating one. Um, the only downside to fans, I think sometimes they blow like really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Did I spit everywhere? No, I played with your piping oh. bag and I got it. I got it. It's, oh, okay. it's good now. Um, Remember, this is live, folks. <laughs> so, it just, it, I don't think there's a bad one, but I do think like the dehydrator, it's nice because you've got like a dedicated space for it and you've got multiple racks that you can hit all six racks uh, or eight, whatever it has at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, if you're doing a fan, if you have like a tower fan, you have a bun rack that can kind of work, but you you need to make sure the, the hair air, air is hitting it. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know your base icing is right? I'm going to answer that one before going back to the Valentine presale one. Um, that is something that you learn through trial and error, or you come take a class where we show you what does it look like to be under, what does it look like to be right on, and what does it look like to be over. Um, I haven't over beaten my icing yet. Can you put a to do and to update our royal icing course to add a section that shows what really over beat icing looks like? Because there are some recipes out there that are like, turn your mixer to five and let it go for 10 minutes. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's going to turn into something else. We finish our royal icing like end to end three minutes. 
and like anything over that you get into like florals kind of consistency and then beyond florals is overbeat so we have to make a video on this you got it okay got it for valentine pre-sales what have you experienced being best sellers and at what price hmm the best sellers heavily depends on your demographic and your area. The best sellers for New York City is going to be very different from the best sellers in like Waco, Texas, right? So I think you take a look at your demographic and who's around you and who's been buying your cookies. And based on that, you kind of see what they like. Um, I'm going to give an example and like we all have like that kind of stereotypical Pinterest mom that we know that we love that's really into Ray Dunn. This this is not to like say that that's bad. It's just saying that that's something we're all familiar with and we know. So one year I did a set of cookies that was all hearts and it was like Kate Spade and Ray Dunn mix where I took Kate Spade's purse that was white with polka dots on it. And I took some other elements of Kate Spade's design, but I piped lettering like hugs, kisses, XOXO using the Ray Dunn sort of font. People loved it. So it just kind of depends. And so I can't like say 100%, but you also look at trends. So you go on Pinterest and you look at the things that are really popular in other industries, not just cookies. And you use that to kind of decide what you want to do. For Valentine's Day specifically, I noticed that most people don't order full dozen, two dozen cookies. They want smaller options that they can gift as a part of their like Valentine's Day card or addition to like a chocolate or maybe just have a little four piece mini, three piece mini, singles, two sets with a punny card attached to it. Those tend to do really well for Valentine's Day. Also open to any other um, experience that you guys have had on the call. Uh, when it comes to Valentine's Day pre-sales. Jessica, what's selling well this year? <laughs> um, I was going to say, it's been really weird because I opened in 2019. So 2020, obviously, like, wasn't there. It was almost non-existent. Well, actually, because it did right before. So I did, like, a pop-up there. Um... This year on my list, well, I have an Eddie, so I'm doing a printed happy or a printed customized photo with mm -hmm. a hand and then a handwritten happy Valentine's Day heart. So it'd be two cookie sets. I find like the sets are cute too, like the um, we go together like mm -hmm. this and that type sets. Those are really popular. Um, but Valentine's Day is one of those weird ones for me because my demographic and my customer base is moms and women, and they're not typically the ones buying for Valentine's Day, right? It's usually the men in the past that have been buying for Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day is always a weird holiday. Um, one year I did like individual conversation hearts um, and they were not minis, but they were also not big. They were about two and a half to three inches across and every one of them was on a Valentine's Day card. Sold the shit out of them. Uh, $5 each, people like lost it. Like the Miss Cookie packaging boxes. I bought I these last it. year, hoping that they would sell. I think about like 75 or something and I only sold like 30 maybe, but maybe 20. Um, but they're cute. I do the conversation hearts in these. I do the, um, I did a paint your own one. So I just iced heart cookies with white icing and added a little paint palette from the cookie mm -hmm. countess. Um, I did chocolate covered strawberry sugar cookies. Mm. So it's just a strawberry sugar cookie that looks like a chocolate covered strawberry. Um, and then um, Brighton Cutters has the, um, chocolate oh yeah the, the chocolate the chocolates yeah. um so you could do those in there too there's lots of different things but these are cute i always like the boxes cool <laughs> all right anybody else any insights speak now 
I like the stick people with the little red hearts on them. When people hand draw the stick people. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Red hearts. That's like one of my favorites. I, I'm just really new at this, so I haven't really done anything yet. So, but I think they're cute. Mm. Uh, we have a follow up from Carolyn. Thank you for that. So I've tried to talk to her and try to price similar, but she won't engage. First of all, if they won't engage and you've done your part, it is what it is. Um, you have to just keep doing your thing. Um, you can only do so much. Do you have suggestions for shred fill for boxes? I have a confession. I hate shred. I hate it. It just gets everywhere. It's really hard to use to package. If I can steer anybody towards using box backers or tissue paper, I would do that. It's less work for you too. But if you have to, or you prefer to get shred, Paper Mart has a lot of shred for very inexpensive. We will also send out a link to our resources page that has this info. I list like literally every resource I know of where I buy boxes, packaging, supplies, etc. So we'll send that out um, in the follow up. All right, any other questions from you guys here or topics that you guys want to cover? Otherwise, we have more questions from email, right? I have a question. And I'm just like, I've only been doing this for six months and it's not a business. It's just Congrats. for fun. But um, so if I want like a lemony cookie, mm -hmm. do I just substitute the vanilla for like lemon? um there's a that, couple of things you can do so the one thing that i would for sure suggest is lemon zest in your okay. dough so don't omit the vanilla so if you're using like vanilla bean you can maybe like swap it for vanilla extract if you want it more lemon forward and if you want a lot of lemon you can even use lemon juice in your royal icing oh. and that will give it a instead very instead of some of the water juice. instead of some of the water Mm -hmm. okay. about half water half lemon juice it tastes really good I really enjoy it. it's like sweet oh, really yeah I have to mean it. it's been a long time mm. okay. okay thank you now we have a follow-up since inflation madness I've been trying a lot of different meringue powders to find one that is not crazy expensive but they're <laughs> not all equal do you have a favorite brand there are some things that you can compromise on and some things that you can't. For me, the things I can compromise are granulated sugar. I do not care what brand. Flour, it doesn't really matter. Vanilla bean paste, I care a lot about. Meringue powder, I care a lot about. Um, I have not found a meringue powder I like more than Jeannie's Dream Meringue Powder. Um, it works for me, but I also know, and it says it directly on the package that if you overbeat Jeannie's Dream, you're going to have a problem. Um, but Janie's Dream is expensive. So the most economical way is to go for the Wilton ones and wait for the Michaels coupons and use that on the Wilton meringue powder from Michaels. A lot of people use Wilton and it works out just fine. So I think if um, money is the biggest thing, do that. Otherwise, raise your prices across the board a couple of dollars to help compensate for um, the, the brand that you like. So when you say three minutes and you're beating your royal icing three minutes from end to end, is that like when you first add your water to your meringue powder and you whisk it? And then when yeah. you add the rest of the ingredients, it's just a total of three minutes from start yep. to finish? Yeah, wow. it takes me three minutes. I've if I'm doing a demo, maybe five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have, um, we'll also throw on the link for the 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 workshop that we did in November, um, the Zoom workshop. Mm. And that way it's live. We don't cut anything out. It's not professionally filmed. It is just exactly raw and what it is. That's the one we'll send out. I don't care for the Wilton flavor one either. Yeah, you know, we all start somewhere. I started mm -hmm. with literal fresh egg whites and then pasteurized egg whites and then mm -hmm. a gazillion brands of meringue powder. And then finally, when I tasted Genie's Dream, I was like, mm, this is for me, but it's not for everyone. Where do you buy it? Uh, we'll send you a link. It's going to be on the resources uh, blog post that we'll send out. Okay, thank you. 
And Rachel, are you, did you get this through the email list or are you in one of our classes? Is it, how, how did you find out? I took a class. Okay, sweet. Then uh, yeah, you should be, it should be on there. I just want to make sure you get the info. So, so I took the class. I signed up on January 1st or 2nd. Mm -hmm. And so is the link only good for a month to watch the video or I can... Which class did you buy? The November workshop recording? No, it was the, um, oh crap. It was a $40 course. It wasn't the big course. Oh, it it, it, you have forever access, access to yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. CK brand. Is that what you use, Jessica, CK? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Um, last I, I checked, it had gotten up to like, $25 a pound, yeah, which is like expensive. half that price before the, all the yeah. increases started. So I can't remember who I direct ordered from because you have to have a special seller's permit to order from CK themselves That's to get the case. Right. I tried to do it. I never heard back from them after an initial contact, but I found a third party that sells their cases. And I ended up just biting the bullet and buying the case because it averaged out to like $15 a pound. And it's yeah. so expensive, but it'll last like two years. So, <laughs> and if you've got a local cookie friend, I highly suggest buying in bulk and splitting it with your local cookie friends because you can save a ton of money. Uh, follow up, uh, Jessica, would you mind sharing your seller for CK? I like them too. I'll go Google it right now and see if I can find them. Okay, okay cool. Thank if you. you find it, do you mind dropping it in the chat? All right, anyone else on the call that would like to jump in and talk about something? Otherwise um, we'll pull. This is Miranda again. I have to take a call, so I don't know if you cover this, but how do you, um, when you do pre-sales, does that mean that people order it before you make it and then that way you only make what you're ordered? Is that how it works? Generally, the short answer, yes. I think everybody has a little bit different of like a preference on how they run pre-sales. Sometimes pre-sales are exactly that. It's a pre-order where you decide I'm going to only make 24 and that's it. Other times pre-sales are like, uh, I will make as many as I sell within the five days. So it kind of depends, but mostly yes. Okay, and you don't, th those are not discount. It's just like, hey, get in, get in this party. Yeah, over here. you, you want to buy, you buy it now buy, and the sale's now. open. Okay. Yeah, okay. If it's open for five days, you just get five days to order. And if I hit capacity before five days, I'm closing and you will That's lose it. out. Okay. Okay, great. All right, anybody else on the call? I'm an open book. There's no question that's like oh, not yeah. allowed. So. Okay, so I've just been doing this for about a year and I I really like it's a hobby, but yeah. I kind of like want to start a business, but I think I want to start doing pop-ups. And But okay. I, when do you know how to take it to that level? I mean, this is just really mm -hmm. scary. I've been watching these things and taking all these classes and and there's just so many things that I, yeah. I hear about a new thing, like you can't do a Snoopy cookie or you can't do this kind of cookie mm. or mm. you know this or that. And, and then it's like, I mean, it's just it's very overwhelming. overwhelming. Yeah, um, I think it's the, the world is a little bit more complex than 12 years ago when mm -hmm. I was really breaking into all of it. When I was breaking into all of this, we were all legal right? We didn't have cottage food loss in a lot of states mm -hmm. at that time. So even if you have like the tiniest bit of desire to try it out, I think there's no substitute for just jumping in and experiencing <laughs> that chaos for the first time. So to reduce a little bit of the risk and a little bit of stress, you know, reach out to like a local mom and pop shop, and maybe you already have one in mind and say, hey, I want to explore having a pop-up. Um, and then figure out what you're going to sell and don't overthink it, make your product, try to get the word out there about what's going on. Ask that shop if they'll also help you in that marketing. 
get out there and sell your stuff. See what happens. Mm -hmm. And then you might decide that you like it. You might decide that you hate it. But then like the whole, like uh, the thing where like you have a kid and it was a really horrible experience, but then you have another one, you get a little <laughs> bit of amnesia. Um, the same thing can happen to us <laughs> as cookiers. <laughs> like we will have stayed up literally for three days in a row and we tell ourselves in the moment i'm never doing this again but for some reason you know selling stuff gives you so much joy that for, you just decide you want to do it again so try it once struggle come back to us you know we're here for you if you have any questions ask your questions try it again and if you decide you hate it you never have to do it again because right. i've given a lot of free cookies away like to my yeah. dentist to my rheumatologist and they're like oh you should do this these are so great you know and but, and it's just, the whole thing is just very overwhelming. How long did you go at the, the free, just giving stuff away time before you said you're going to venture out and do your own first pop-up? Mm, from like zero to pop-up, it took me a while because when I decorated my first cookie, it was like 2011, cookie decorating hit, didn't hit like the hype that mm. it's experiencing right now. Uh, I think my first pop-up was in 2014, 2015. I had no idea what I was doing. No guides, nothing. Half of my stuff looked like crap. You don't even know where to source your, you know, your packaging, right? Like you just don't know. Um, I wasn't even licensed at that point because we had a lot of restriction around cottage foods during that time. Um, but I found a friend who like was like, you should just do the thing. So I did it. And that's how I started. Yeah. Well, in yeah. In California, there's two levels. Yeah. I'm in Ohio and it seems like the cottage food license is just really like non-existent. I mean, the only restriction I think I have is that I can't ship out of state. I can mm. ship within Ohio, but I can't ship out of state. Yeah, but every every state is different and even every county has their own specific little quirks. Mm -hmm. um, and in some states, there are various levels of cottage foods where you can only sell direct to person or you can not wholesale. So depending on where you are, if you wanna be on the total mm -hmm. up and up, yes. But mm -hmm. we come from, this is like a no judgment zone and everybody starts somewhere. Mm -hmm. um so i think just do it just try it well there's gonna be cookie con in ohio that's just gonna be 40 minutes away from me and i was yeah. just so excited but the cost of it is so expensive and right now i'm just doing this for fun so mm -hmm. i i really don't know if i want to make that investment or not Mm, this goes to this this turned into like a is cookie con worth it question right <laughs> which is no. which is fine it's which just because i it's been so far away from me i would have to get on a plane to go but now it's just within driving this you know short away mm. it's in Sandusky, um, which is not far from me so we have a video on this too but it's like two years old okay. but that's okay because like the same concepts still apply mm -hmm. Um, I think take advantage of the opportunity. If you have the money and you can afford it, go because you're going to have the experience of being surrounded and overwhelmed with like five, six, a thousand, maybe even other women who are into mm -hmm. cookies. And it's crazy, but it's also awesome because you're with your people. <laughs> um, a lot of people go alone. So like that's a, a very nor normal and common thing. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of make friends on the go. If you follow like one track, you can kind of go with your group of people. Highly recommended for anybody who is able to go just check it out. And then you can do all your shopping and go crazy. Then you make I just, some friends make and some you can friends. bulk order your meringue powder together. I just think and, yeah. taking these classes all the time online is, it's got to be different when you have some, when you're doing oh, it yeah. right in front of somebody. And I'm dying to do that. And I feel like very few cookiers do things exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. um, so like 
the benefit to following one cookier is you can kind of see their entire process and understand the context of all the little things that go into the final result. If you pick bits and pieces from cookiers, when you come back and you're new, you're like, okay, what part actually like applies to me based on my equipment, environment, technique, right? Mm -hmm. But it's all going to be good regardless mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So having the physical face-to-face, -face, I think is really worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll think about it. Not paid to say this. That's right. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Pop-up questions. Selling cookies for fundraiser. Sell cookies to fundraiser ticket to cookie con. I would love that idea. Uh, the one does a pop-up have the same rules? Pop-up rules are very ambiguous. Some places it depends on the location to how stringent they are with their pop-up rules, because sometimes people need uh, permits to be able to pop up at certain locations. So it depends on where you're popping up. I should go or somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Have to, just got to meet Lisa. Oh. Yeah, I won't be at CookieCon this year because there's just not enough time to do like all the cookie things. But oh, we got a question on that. We got about 10 minutes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's take in. some more. Wow. Yeah, That's really that flies so fast. Uh, so I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, but still drop any questions that you can because we'll try yeah. to get to them if we have time. Otherwise, we're going to run through the ones we got in the email. So first up is, what is the best way to get that silver look to the wedding ring cookies? I want to use food safe silver product. Thank ah. you, Sally. Oh, hi, Sally. Hi, Sally. Uh, thank you for your question, Sally. Um, the silver food safe silver product that I use today is called New Silver or dark silver by the sugar art we'll drop her a link and you mix it with a high proof clear alcohol or you can use color solution so that, that's that was straightforward that was easy all right next we have shelly uh what is the best advice you can give for starting i'm as a home baking home cookie business sorry i had to add a couple words there sorry shelly and the home cookie, that's it? What is yeah, advice? best advice that you can give for a home cookie business. <laughs> best advice. For that's, an, that's an open-ended question, like so many Yeah, things. so um, I guess that's the first thing that jumps out to you. What do you think? Man, um, home cookie business. Be prepared to experiment and fail a lot. Mm. Um and be totally at peace with that because you're going to be experimenting and failing when you make your menu, when you put your products out there, some are going to stick, some are just not going to stick. You're going to get lucky. You're going to get unlucky. Oh, someone said buy a large freezer. Mm. I would wait on the freezer and here's why, because she might start doing this and she might hate it. It might not be for her. And then she's going to be like, no, I have a freaking freezer. I have to resell. <laughs> Uh, I'd say jump in to the deep end and do everything and say yes as much as possible. Overload yourself to the absolute max, like breaking point max. And I don't say that because I'm like, I like pain. <laughs> I'm saying that. Burnout, it's great. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's not the point of this. It's really to tell, to show yourself what your limit is. Because once you hit that, you're like, I never want to be there again. And now you can decide if you're lying to yourself or you're not. Mm. So test yeah, system. stress test, this, the really stress test, because for me, like I had two and a half years where I worked a full-time job. I came home, I did all my house life wife things. And then from like 9.30 to three, I would do cookie stuff, wake up at seven and go back to work. Two and a half years. I don't know, like, I don't want to do that anymore, right? And she might be in a phase of life where she does not want to do that or she cannot. So stress test, that's a big, big thing. Great, that's good advice. Yeah. Uh, I often have bleeding whenever I have black icing on top of white. Mm -hmm. I have tried letting base completely dry and letting it just crust for an hour or so, and it doesn't seem to make a difference. I've tried a thicker and thinner top consistency, Thinner seems worse, but thicker still bleeds. Any help would be much appreciated. I haven't tried white gel color mm. and base, but was going to try that next. From Beth. 
white gel in your base is definitely going to help a little bit, but it sounds like if she's already doing those things, it's she a... Hasn't tried the white gel yet. Yes, but if she's doing all oh, these other gosh. things, it sounds like she has a base consistency problem. Mm, back and to that's the base. The, they, people don't talk about this. Getting your base icing to the right consistency is not just the final icing. The base has to be good. No foundation, no, you know. That's it. Yeah. So I hate these online foolproof BS recipes. I know. Foolproof. All right, anything Perfect. else? That was, that was the last one we had in the email. I'll take an, I'll take a check. One more. Let's see if any Did you say you have a royal icing course? Yes, I do. I want to see, I want to know which one you bought. Maybe we can look her up, Rachel. Yeah. And then we can see what she bought and then figure out like which one would actually help her. Or you're in Elk Grove. You should just come over. Okay. <laughs> and we'll film it. Yeah, you could come over, we could film it, you know, whatever, and then I'm up for that. I'm retired. So whenever whatever works mm, for you. I think in-person classes are coming back though, because okay. like they're everyone's feeling a little bit better. Rachel, do you have, what's your what's your email? Dough and ice and base. She should have she you should have access to did you did you oh use... yeah the rural icing part of it yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah. thought you meant you had a whole totally separate rural ice we have a lot of different like icing things so we teach classes based on like the basic stuff but we also teach classes based on design so like sometimes if we're doing a certain design we'll make the icing from scratch in that same session and then sometimes we also have live zoom sessions where we do um like live workshops just like this but we're making icing together real time. Okay. Awesome. All right. Any Was other questions helpful? from the seen, people? Not seeing anything yet. I have one more. There we go. Do you have it listed anywhere? I have the Pico projector like you do. I need the cords to hook it up from my laptop to the Pico. I ordered one, but it was the wrong one, apparently. I don't know the input and output. I didn't know if you had it on your blog somewhere. Mm. Uh, my blog post, my, I will, I will let you know. Okay. I think my blog post has that, but I'm not hundred percent sure. I'm tired of using USBs and changing sizes and coming well, back and forth. I mean, <laughs> I use USBs. Like, honestly, I think the answer is just to upgrade your projector at this point, because really? I too will be doing that soon. <laughs> Maybe it's time. Yeah. I'll wait for your recommendation. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. I'll let you guys know. Okay. What projector do you have? I have, I'll send you a link. I have yeah. the AXA, AXA Technologies. It's very like the first generation of high-tech projectors uh -huh. that was like after the copy cake. So oh. I'll send it. There are much better new ones out there today. Oh, okay. I have an AXA I bought and it's wireless Bluetooth. I love it. But is it pretty, my, it's pretty new, right? Yes. Yeah. My, my future son-in-law had to show me how to use it though and i love I it could do it and i just really really like it i mean we might potentially have a little a little something for you guys yeah. we're trying to work with axa right now to see if we can get a something going for our cookie family stay tuned yeah <laughs> well then my daughter-in-law got me a label maker but I have to try to figure out how to make the ingredient labels. Yes. Because that's, all that technology stuff is an issue for me. It's okay. You know, like if you have someone around you who's willing to help, I think that's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, do you still use a light projector? Uh, demo unwrap with it sometimes. Light projector? Light projector? Um, they were talking about this. This I, was updated for March 2020. Did I, but... I didn't, I never got one though. That's yeah. something that someone has a light projector. I just have one projector. Hmm. Are you talking about, oh, are you talking about this? The Canva? Like the, the, the. Looks kind of like a halo, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I have the, the Canva. I, I'm using it right now as a yeah. ring light. <laughs> Yeah, um, I still use it. It's great. A uh, canvas, sorry, not Canva, yeah. canvas. And uh, Alva in here actually has an affiliate link where you can save some money. And I love it. I use it all the time. 
and I take it with me to like do streaming because of the ring light. Brighton has, um, I got a text from Brighton. They're having mm -hmm. a sale today. If you type in mystery when you check out. Brighton, Brighton Cutters? Mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. Mystery. Another, another coupon code love, for y'all. Love mystery codes. <laughs> All right, any other questions before we kind of bend things here and then meet back next month? This was fun, thank you. Good. This was Happy. fun, thank you. Yes, Good. thank you so much. Thank you all so much. We will send a follow-up with the link to the recording and also uh, Lots of stuff. links. Lots of links. <laughs> all right, guys, take care. Thanks. See you next time. Bye. Bye.